So here I've got a Kodak Retina Reflex 3 camera and uh, I want to do a series of videos on how you'd go about repairing one of these common faults that you find and general servicing when you get a camera that needs servicing because things don't work as they should do although nothing is actually broken. So the Reflex 3, an interesting camera and probably one of the simplest of the Ref Kodak Retina Reflexes to work on. The Reflex 3 of course didn't come out of nowhere. It had predecessors, so we'll go into that briefly. Let's see what we've got here. Well the Retina Reflex line started with this one, called, usually referred to as the original Retina Reflex. It's the Type 025, and this was introduced in 1957. That was quite a long time ago. The features of this camera, um, it doesn't have an instant return mirror, none of these cameras do. The lens system on this camera was the same C-type lenses as was used on the Retina 3C folding cameras in the 2C. So, a little bit different in that way. The Lenses could be exchanged, you could only exchange, they were a convertible lens, you could only exchange the front a group, the rear group stays in the shutter. So the front group was interchangeable and there was an 80mm f4 lens and a 35mm f4 lens that you could swap in for the standard lens. These are quite a nice wee camera. Shutters reasonably quiet as reflexes go. Um, cup, uncoupled meter on this camera, so no cords or anything exciting like that. Um, not much more to say about it really. It was uh, was considered um, an advance, if you like, from the 3C rangefinder cameras when the whole world was moving to SLRs. So that was the original one, and they made them for a couple of years. And then after that, Kodak came out with this one, which is the Reflex S. Different beast, much the same body as the earlier camera, similar styling, different in some of its features. We have a coupled exposure meter. So it's coupled to the settings of the shutter and the aperture. The whole lens is interchangeable on this camera, not just the front group, which means that you had a wider variety of different focal length lenses that you could use. Full range of speeds, you know, 1 to a 500th of a second. The aperture with this particular, that's an f1.9 lens, so apertures from f1.9 down to f22. Quite a nice camera, traditional styling if you like. Um, once you're over the usual hump with retinas that the film advances on the bottom, that certainly worries some people. Shutter release on the top. Nice comfortable camera to hold, nice comfortable camera to use. Then came the three. And the 3 was, you could say it was based on the S. It's similar in a lot of ways. Same lenses, same shutter. What was different? Well, we've got the exposure meter here, and that's actually visible in the finder. So you can see you can see your meter needle without taking the camera away from your eye. Anything else exciting? Oh yeah, the shutter release. Instead of having the shutter release on the top cover, the shutter release is now on the front plate. And that's a feature that a lot of people don't like. It just seems a little bit unusual. They work perfectly fine, but as the film advances on the bottom of the cameras, it's not something that a lot of people particularly like at all. So, same deal, same selection of lenses. This camera would have come with either a 50mm f1.9 lens or a 50mm 
f2.8 lens. Let's put those back on the camera. Now the Reflex 3. There were two of them. Here's the other one. One of them, the setting button for the changing your uh, film speeds of the meter is on the top of the camera, here. On the other one, the later one, is a button here on the back that you have to hold up, push upwards towards the top of the camera while you turn the, the wheel at the base of the camera in order to change the speeds. And there was also another change there. The size of the selenium cell. This is the earlier one. You'll see that that selenium cell is smaller than the selenium cell on the larger one, later camera. But otherwise, the Reflex 3s, both of those examples, worked in exactly the same way. And the Reflex 3 wasn't the end of the story, of course, because there was a Reflex 4. And what was different with the Reflex 4? There was a few things, really. A little window here. Now that um, illuminates the, or it allows you to see the shutter and aperture speeds set. You can see them in the finder, which is a handy feature. Same system of a shutter release button on the front of the camera as the 3 had. What else was different? Well, the shutter was different. We still have our same range of speeds, sort of 1 to 500. But instead of having a uh, two flash sinks, the X and the M sync, the X being for electronic flash and the M sync being used for bulb, this camera is only equipped with an X sync. So it's really set for using with an electronic flash. So I suppose you could say that was paving the way for the, the world of the future. I haven't used flash bulbs in a few years. So that's the four. And that's the one we're not looking at at the moment. We're going to be looking at the Reflex 3. And I have two nice working examples here. And I'll go through that and give you a, a little bit more in-depth view of the features and how they function. And then after that, we'll get into the business of how you go about taking them apart. A bit of a discussion about the faults that these cameras sometimes display and how you'd go about with dealing with those problems if you strike them. So here's a Retina Reflex 3. This is the latter type. Meter setting button on the back. Larger selenium cell. In terms of using the camera, the only difference between this and the earlier model with the meter setting button on the top is pretty much simply that. It's the meter setting button position. Everything else functions in exactly the same way. So the cameras, what can we say about the features of the camera? We've had a wee discussion about the, the features already. But how does that relate to actually using these things and how do they work when they're working well? Okay, so let's have a quick look at that. Film Advance we've already covered, it's on the base of the camera, one full swing, advances the film and cocks the shutter. Shutter release here on the front of the camera. When the shutter's cocked, the mirror drops into the viewing position, the capping plate covers the film at the back, and the shutter is open. The aperture and the lens is opened up full, so you see it looking at that view, full aperture. When you release the shutter, various actions happen. The shutter will close, the aperture will stop down to the set aperture, the mirror will rise, and the capping plate will rise, and the shutter will open and close to make the exposure. And then you're back to your start position. With the shutter in the closed position, the mirror in the up position, you can see nothing through the viewfinder. It's not an instant return mirror. 
when everything's working well, it's all good. You're a bit noisy, but um, no worse than most SLRs in that regard. So how would you go about using the camera? Well, what are the features we need to be concerned with? First thing probably you're going to be worrying about is setting your film speed on the meter. This style, you push that button, you push it towards the top of the camera, push it upwards, and simultaneously you turn the wheel at the base of the camera. That will rotate that meter dial there, and you can move that to a different film speed setting. Release this button, and it'll stay where you've left it more or less. So that's all there is to doing it on that one. The earlier camera, the button's on the top here, but otherwise it's the same deal. Hold that button down firmly, turn the wheel on the base of the camera, and you'll see that you can adjust your film speed. Release the button on the top of the camera, and the film speed remains set where you've left it. Loading the film. Open the back of the camera. If you're used to retinas, you'll know about the back catch cover. Swing that out of the way, exposes the button, press the button, the back opens. Job done. Here you can see the camera. This is obviously in the released position. You can see the back of the shutter blades there. If it was cocked, the, the capping plate would be visible there. Let's cock it now. See the capping plate comes down? That makes a light tight seal around that uh, film gate. And of course it disappears up before the shutter opens and closes to make the exposure. So loading a film on this sort of camera is easy enough. Just lift the rewind knob, drop your film in, put the end of the film into the slot in the take-up spool, roll it over the sprocket, shut the back of the camera, wind and fire three times. And then you can set it to number one or Alternatively, what's this film? This film's a 20, 24 shot. So normally you would set, set this immediately after loading film, as soon as you've got that first wind on there. Here is the frame counter button. Just press that forward. This is a 24 shot, so let's bring, go right around here. So 24 shots in practice here, you'd want to set that to a 20, 27, that allows for your blank frames. When these cameras were new, the standard films were either 20 shot or 36 shot. Yeah, you'd leave it about there, starting at 27. And you just wind and fire. until your counter shows 24 in our case that means you've got 24 exposures ready to fire if it was a 36 shot film let's have a look at that you'd load your film just get it spooled up you don't have to wind up any number of turns just make sure it's spooled up you would set your camera the frame counter there's a little diamond mark you can see it just coming into view there, that diamond mark is where you would set that counter up to. So there. That allows you three blank frames before you get to your 36, which is where you'd be lined up for your first shot. Similarly, there's another little diamond mark here. Oh, I've gone past it now. right there at the 23 mark there's a little diamond there that's where you would set that for a 20 shot film of course you don't get 20 shot films anymore but basically that diamond mark is sitting there at um, 23 
So by the same token, if you were setting a 24 shot film, you would set your counter to 27. And that's before you wind on your three blank shots before you're ready to go. Because when you've wound on your three blank shots, you'd, it would be showing your the number you'd, you'd set that to for your film. Right, so that's easy enough loading the film. What happens when you get to the end of the film? It will cheat a bit. I'm just going to advance the counter a bit here. Let's drop that down to, uh, yeah, that's about seven shots left. So what happens when you get to the end of the film? Wind and fire through our shot. Yeah, counts at number one. The film advance is locked. That tells you that you're at the end of the film. You're in no danger of tearing the sprocket holes or out of the film or anything, assuming you'd set the counter correctly to begin with. So we're at the end of the film. Normally that's all you need to worry about. You press your rewind button, it'll lock into position. The top of the camera, you just rotate your rewind knob here. You can see there's an arrow engraved on the top cover, tells you which way to turn it. This is not a two-stage business, it's on the Retina 3 Seasoner, like you lift up the rewind knob and you've got plenty of space to do it. This one, you keep that rewind knob down. Don't lift it up halfway, it'll just lift out of the cassette, you'll get nowhere with it. Is it winding the film? Well, you can tell. If you look down at the rewind button, there's a little hole in it. You'll see that rotating as I turn the rewind knob. That tells you that the sprocket is rotating, which means that you've still got film in the camera. Now, I just heard a click then as something happened. You can see I'm still turning the knob, but the uh, hole is not turning. So it tells me that the sprocket is no longer turning. If you want to leave the leader out of your cassette, as you may well do if you're processing your own black and white film, for example, you've done the job. We can open the back of the camera. There's our film leader sticking out, all ready to shove into the uh, developing tank. So that's how everything works when it's working well. Setting shutter speeds on the camera. How do you go about doing that? Assuming you've got your meter already set, setting the shutter speed, you can see them marked here, it's simply a matter of turning that ring. As you'll see as you turn the shutter speed, that the aperture scale counter rotates. Basically that's keeping the exposure the same. So if you've got, let's just turn this to some nice whole, round, whole numbers, 15th of a second at f8, is basically the same as the 30th of a second at f4, f5.6 rather, or a 60th at f4. And you'll see the way they counter-rotate. The meter's staying static. Now that's the way it's supposed to work. Very often, of course, with older cameras, things are a little bit sticky and things don't work quite as well as that. If you rotate, set a shutter speed, and you hold the camera up to your eye, look at your subject, and you can centre up the meter needle, which is visible in the finder. Of course, the shutter's got to be cocked to be doing anything useful in that regard. The meter needle also appears on the top cover. So as you turn the wheel on the bottom of the camera, you're centering up your needle there in the meter, which won't do here probably because we're in the dark. Oh, it's just coming into view. And once it gets to the end of its motion there, it'll start moving the shutter speed button as well. But assuming that you had the shutter speed in something like, let's get this pointing out the window. I'll get my film speed set to something vaguely useful. I've got my shutter speed set at a 60th. So I turn that wheel, and you can watch this needle swinging into position. Swinging across, our needle is coming to the middle position there. 60th of a second at f8. 
So that tells you what a dirty day it is outside here at the moment. So that's all you'd need to do to set your exposure. Of course you can change your shutter speed. The aperture counter rotates, so instead of having a 60th of a second at f8, we've got a 30th of a second at f11. It's the same exposure. All you've done is change which shutter speed you're using or which aperture you're using to get the same correct exposure. So adjusting that's fine. What tends to happen with the older cameras you often get a lot of stiffness in the mechanism and you probably find that the detent spring for the shutter is probably not as detentish as it once was so that when you set the shutter speed and you turn the wheel at the bottom which in theory should just move your meter and your aperture to um, give you the correct exposure you often find that it'll have a tendency to pull the shutter speed ring at the same time this one's not going to do it now for me, it's just going to make a liar out of me. But this camera's been serviced. Generally speaking, you tend to find that unless you hold your finger on the shutter speed settings ring, it has a tendency to move while you're adjusting the aperture. But that's no, no hardship there, all you can do is put your finger on it. It's just like you'd hold anything on the camera really. This particular camera, it's been serviced, so it, it's behaving almost like a new one. What else have we got to say about it? We've already dealt with the issue with the film advance. That locks when you get to number one. Film's out. To unlock your film advance, you must advance the counter from the number one position. If you pick up one of these cameras and it's locked and nothing seems to want to move, first thing to do is check the frame counter. As soon as we move that off there, one push took me to that diamond setting. That's where you would be if you just put a 36 shot film in there. We can move the film advance. The rewind button pops up automatically. Camera's cocked and ready to go. Let's have a quick look inside here. That's where we put our lenses in, of course. The lenses are coupled in a couple of places. One lever opens the lens up to the full aperture. The other one, this one here, one of them moves the aperture, the depth of field pointers. This one moves our depth of field pointers and sets the maximum aperture, or the set aperture really. The other one will open and close the lens and if you're holding this one up to say halfway through its range, something like that, and I press the other one, it'll open up but it'll only drop down as far as the set aperture which is controlled by this one. And the set aperture of course also sets the position of our depth of field pointers. How are those organised in the camera? On our aperture, the setting of our aperture happens with this tab right here. And as we turn the meet the wheel here, you'll see that rises and falls. That would be adjusting the set aperture on your lens and the depth of field pointers with it. On the other side, we have the lever that opens the lens up for full aperture on viewing. And that one, you'll see that this lever moves as I cock the shutter. So it moves down there, and that action would open the lens up to full aperture for viewing. And when you release the shutter, that thing will pop back up, which would let the lens drop back to its set aperture. Well, I think that pretty much covers the real basics of how the camera is supposed to work. And uh, we can deal more with faults from here on in. So the good camera can go away. And I'll introduce my hand-chosen victims to uh, demonstrate 
faults, what causes them, and how you go about dealing to them. Kodak Retina Reflex 3. As you can see, I've got a few cameras here in front of me. Now all of these are in my serious casualties bin. These are cameras, any of which could be resurrected given enough work and enough parts. But none of them are stunning examples. And uh, three of them have meters fitted, but two of them at least say that the meter is completely dead. So these are not stunning examples, but I want to use the Retina Reflex 3 to go through how to repair Kodak Retina Reflexes. And the Reflex 3 is a very good place to start because it's sort of intermediate from the Reflex S and the Reflex 4 has some features of both. It's a very robust camera. They made lots and lots of them and probably because it's the middle child they're not especially sought after. But um, they are a good camera all the same. So it's a good place to start if you're wanting to learn how to repair a, kit, a retina reflex. These ones will all have their various challenges and uh, what I'll do is I'll probably pick one or two likely victims out of here and strip them down. Um, and as I find other faults, I'll bring in other cameras to show you the other faults. So this will not be a straightforward strip down service and pack up and send home video or series of videos. This one I'll try and delve into all the common faults and some of the uncommon faults and how you would deal with them. And um, in at least one of these cases, I know one of these cameras has had the control rods for the mirror and capping plate completely buggered up. And getting that part right is an interesting thing to do and it, it's well worth knowing about that. Sometimes you can straighten those rods up and they will function well, but they only need to have a slight bend in them, a slight... Sl you only need the roller on the top of them to be slightly off-centre. And as soon as you cock the shutter, the, the lever folds over and you're back where you started off. So... But that being said, here's our pile of useful stuff, potentially. All of these, I've got a little tag on, well most of them, saying what their faults were when I gave them a quick look over. We'll go through the list. So after my selection process I have this one. No meter, shutter needs serviced, probable damage to transfer shaft, prism looks okay and the screen needs to be cleaned. See note inside back. Let's see if there is a note inside the back. Oh, there is. This is a roughy. It's got no meter in it. What's it say? Has been murdered. Good meter, good transfer shaft, etc. Shame about the meter, the mirror setting stuff. Well, that means something bad's happened to this one. You can see that the shutter is not quite open. Let's have a look inside the back, see if there's any clues there. The capping plate is sitting not shut, not closed and not open. And looking in from the front, it's difficult to say what's going on there. The mirror doesn't seem to be sitting at the right angle. So this one's had a hard life. It's a well-worn camera. Lots of uh, lost paint on the back of the door there. The leatherettes are very, very polished from handling. I'd say this camera's done a lot of work. The top of the camera, the accessory shoe here is very brassy. And it's also bashed in. This one's been dropped on its head. However, 
it'll make a good subject subject for repair I would say pop its little note back in there this camera certainly has had a hard life the uh, back catch cover here has been thumped in that's bent down still moves reasonably well the rewind knob that one's lost its film reminder dial what other one have we got here I've got a selection of cameras so I can show you various faults and we can talk about fixes this one shutter does not work and the meter is dead well the shutter opens it doesn't release so I'd say that's um, that description was okay then that was fairly accurate this one that's the one we've just looked at this other one, this one's a bit of a bitzer needs a prism, meter and top cover and it needs servicing so this one may have multiple issues the shutter does cock normally mirror stays down Our front rings here are off. You see that the film, the speeds are right around there, and the in the register is at the top. So these front rings are in the wrong place. That means that very likely um, things have been mucked up there. Someone's had these front rings off. You can't get those things out of order any other way. Someone's had these front rings off. They put them back in the wrong place. The shutter speed could be set to anything. We've got no way of telling. All we know is it's not really set to knurled plastic knob. It's got to be set to a speed. I'd say the guess that was set for somewhere around a fifteenth of a second. So that one, that'll be an interesting one. I'll see if I can show you how you go about getting the rings back in the correct position assuming no other damage has happened and uh, you just want to get them back where they should be we'll deal with that later